These are youth, guys. And let me, let me just tell you right now, they're not the church of tomorrow. Hello? Amen. They're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. Yeah. And, and, and just let me declare over them even now. There are gifts and callings in their hearts, many of which have not yet been discovered, but will be. And so I'm just asking you to agree with us that God will cause clarity in their hearts and lives and the callings upon them that they may declare not only the great works of God, but they may see how valuable they are in the kingdom. And that God will begin to prompt them to step forward in great and mighty ways. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, Thank we're going to give Lord. you an excuse to be out of church today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to be in church later again. This was once. We won't forgive you if you do it again, but right now we will. Okay. All right, Brother Randy, pray over them. Declare some great things in their lives. Okay, dear Heavenly Father, we just lift up each and every one of these youth yes. and the leaders that are here. Jesus. And Lord, we just pray for an unobstructed path from your heart to theirs as they go out and enjoy themselves at this camp. Yes, Lord. Lord, I pray that you call the ones that you're going to call into ministry. Speak to those hearts and lives. Yes. Minister yes. through those Hallelujah. hearts and lives of each and every one, Lord. Yeah. I just pray that every step that they take this week or this last few days... Is it furthers your kingdom, yes. and they are the best ambassadors that they can be for your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you give that extra strength and wisdom to these youth leaders and Pastor Dean and Lori as they carry out this assignment that you have given them, and that they take these mighty soldiers for you, yeah. this youth, and that they go out and make lasting friendships, lasting bonds. Yeah. And that they minister and represent you as best they can. Amen. I pray yes. that everybody that lays eyes on each and every one of them here, that they see you, Jesus. Yes. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everybody yeah. said, Amen. 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 And as they go, which aisle are you going out? This one now. Okay, ready? ready? Unit, unit. Come on, church. Unit, 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 unit. unit, unit. <laughs> Glory! We're proud of all of our kids. Hallelujah. Proud of them. Proud of them. Wonderful, wonderful. Some of these kids have been part of our youth ministry. Their parents don't even come here. Um, but their hearts have, been, have, have found the Lord and uh, living their lives for him. So we're so glad for that. Amen. Okay, any unit shirts left in the house? You're going to miss the bus if you don't go. All right, Brother Greg, let's worship and praise the Lord. Amen.
this second verse together one more time. I will bow down and hail you as king. And I will bow down.
in your presence. Because there is no one like you, Jesus. Your abundant and abounding love. We thank you for it. We worship you.
you would have us go. God, don't take from us no for an answer. But God, press your yes into us so that we may be able to respond to amen and so be it in our lives. Thank you, Lord. God, deal with the deepest parts of our hearts. Your word declares that our spirit is the candle of the Lord, searching out the deepest parts of our spirit, Lord. Even we sometimes don't know our deepest motivations or our deepest thoughts or what they're founded upon. And God, reveal to us and deal with us, O oh Lord, about those things that cause us to come to an awareness of your grace, your mercy, and your love your cleansing power, your adjusting power. God, renew our hearts before you. Renew us, oh God, in ways that we can't even begin to imagine or think or ask, God, because we don't know the parameters of your search, but you do. Search us out. See if there be any wicked or evil or turn around way in us that needs to be corrected yeah. and God bring us that kind of personal correction that would refine our lives and cause us, oh Lord, to arise in our most holy faith. God, you're, you're leading me to pray in this direction this morning. We are submitted to you. Thank you, Lord. We're flat out open to you, Lord. Do in us what you desire. Accomplish in us what you desire. Yes, Lord. God, pray through us what you desire. Yes, Lord. I don't want selfish words coming from my mouth and my heart. I don't want words all about me coming from me. I want you to pray through me what you desire so that, Lord, I can hear truly the heart of God. Oh, God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We stand amazed in your presence. And we are blessed and pleased, oh, God, that you call us your own. Accomplish everything innocent through us that you desire. All of our needs we bring before you and lay upon the throne. Those that need a touch in their body today. Those that need direction. Those that need guidance. Those that need uh, provision. Every one of those things, oh Lord, you'll bring in line with your word as we bring our hearts in focus upon you. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Hallelujah. The people of God say, Amen. 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 There's an anointing of grace upon our hearts and our lives today. An anointing of grace and that anointing of grace is to break the yoke of bondage. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. Amen. You know what a yoke is? You, 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 you take a couple of oxen and you put this wooden thing around their necks and 
where one moves, the other's going to move too. And uh, those oxen better behave because there's a guy in the back end that holds the reins. He knows where he wants them to go. And as long as they pay attention, they're A-OK. -okay. They don't pay attention, they get a little on the back side just to kind of turn them, hey, pay attention, you know what's going on. And aren't you glad that God so lovingly cares for each of us? He knows exactly how to guide our lives. Thank you, Lord. See, he can't guide you with my parameters. He can't guide me with your parameters. He guides each of us for what's best for us. Isn't he a smart God? Amen. Wow. Wow. How wonderful. Praise the name of the Lord. We're, we're going to receive the uh, tithe and offering this morning. And I just would, as the ushers are preparing to come forward at, at, at this time, I, I just would ask you to consider this. You know, the Word of God tells us what's best for us. Y'all agree in that? He, he tells us what's best for us. Yeah, that's right. And then he teaches us even about giving. It's always been a matter of seed time and harvest, always. Always has been, always will be. And the Lord says, now, here's what I'd like you to do. Well, I'd like you to bring your tithe into the storehouse, your offerings. And when you do, you're honoring me by giving me the first fruits of your life. Now, let me just tell you, God doesn't need your money. And the farmer that brings would bring his seed into the temple area, God didn't need that seed. But what he needed was the dedication of the heart of the individual. Whether it was seed he brought to the temple or our tithe we bring to the house of faith. He wants us to know that we're planting in. If we're going to trust him with our eternal soul, don't you think we should trust him with our temporal finances? Amen. Yeah. Amen. He didn't ask for 90%. He didn't ask even for 80%. He said, just want you to bring 10% as a sign of the covenant between us. And he said, if you bring all the tithe and the offerings into the storehouse, that there may be meat on my table. He said, I will open the windows of heaven for out of blessings such as there's not enough room to receive at all. And the reason he said that was for our sake, for our good. So when the pastor gets up and talks about finances, don't think, there he goes again. I had a guy leave a church one time because in three different services he, he was there, I mentioned tithe and offering three times, once each service. So what's up with that? Just say it. He got so ticked off, he left the church, never returned. Well, wasn't that just smart of him? And I'm not making fun of the guy, I'm just saying he was listening to the wrong message. Right. If you watch television, you don't get offended over toothpaste commercials. You continue <laughs> to watch the stupid program and endure Colgate once again, or Crest, or whatever. I'm just saying. God says, be faithful and watch me rebuke the devourer for your sake. Thank you, Lord. Hey, it's God's idea, not mine. So I'm going to do it God's way, not my way. And you know what? He will always make a way where there seems to be. So if you honor him with your tithe and offering, he'll honor you in your financial life. Just like you and I need so desperately to honor us. Praise the Lord. Would you just take your offering with your hand? By the way, if you're here from another church, we know that your tithe belongs to the house of faith where you attend faithfully. Call your church home. We do this as a team. My wife and I have always done our tithe as a team. Before we got married, she took care of her tithe, and I took care of my tithe. When we got married, we dedicated the Lord. Man, I went from $100 a month in the Air Force to $200 a month. I was in tall cotton. Yeah. Low rent. And every month, that 20 bucks tithe, 10% of our income, went in the house of faith, plus our offerings. And you know what? Sometimes we ate only bean with bacon soup and popcorn, but I'll tell you what, it was a good beginning. God was always there. <laughs> Would you hold your offering in your hand, please? Lord, 
we now come before you, God Almighty. We've trusted our eternal souls just on the promise that you're going to raise us from the dead and bring us to heaven one day. It's only a promise, Lord. I bet the farm that you're right and the world's wrong. So God, because we bet our lives on that, we live for you with your power to in us and through us. And Lord, you told us to be faithful with, our, with your time and our offering. So that's what we're doing. And God, you've never failed us Hallelujah. ever, Thank ever, you, ever, ever, ever. And even as we are honorable towards you and faithful to you, thank you now for the increase. We bring this to you and offer it to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we give you praise. People, God said. service and they'll give you a packet and a little card to fill out. We'd like to welcome you. Realize there are many places you could be in a place of worship today, but you're here. Thank you for that. Thank you for your faithfulness to the regulars who have come. And um, we just praise the Lord for what we come together for. You know, when you come uh, to church on Sunday morning and we sing and praise and worship the Lord, all of that is not for us, it's for an audience of one. Hallelujah, man. When I sing, sometimes I sing well, sometimes I don't sing well. But the noise that I make is a joyful noise to the Lord. Because he's worthy of my praise. Sometimes when I sing in the shower, my wife will say, what are you saying? Those are not the words of the song. I go, I know. Singing my own words. <laughs> I can make it up. God doesn't care. <laughs> I just worship the Lord, spirit and truth. Same thing about coming to the Word of God. Look, it is my hope that you are not impressed by my speaking abilities. It is my hope that you do not see this as some sort of well-rehearsed speech. It is my hopes that you do not even see this as a product of my education or my preparation. My hope is placed in the Word which promises that Scripture is profitable. Yeah, that's Hello? right. That's right. Amen. Scripture's profitable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of all of the people that are here today, I cannot design a speech or a word of product that will satisfy every heart. There's no way. No one's that talented. But what I can do is be faithful to the Lord and what He places upon my heart so that when I speak the word, the word is more powerful than a two-edged sword dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, mm -hmm. bone and marrow. Simply means this: a sword that cuts both ways is a powerful sword. If it if it only cuts one way and you turn it over and get hit with the blunt end, it'll only bruise your soul. 
but the truth of the word will cut deep so as to inject into you God's ideas and concepts. And not, not only is the word profitable, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I can say, come on guys, give me the program, have great faith in God, that won't work. But if I give you the word of God, God interjects faith, faith rises up in you and in me, and then we respond with the power of his faith he's planted. Yeah. And accordingly, we accomplish what he assigns to us. So with me this morning, let's look at the word of God because this is exactly my intent today. Share with you the word which will do the work. I may look at you and say, well, you need this. And the Holy Spirit is saying, nee, 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 nee. they need this. So that when we leave today, every one of you will have a personal word from God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't God speaking? Thank you, Lord. Mm. I just love it. We've been talking about intentionality this year. Intentional. Intentional. Not on accident, but on purpose. Intent. I was going to go to the store today, and I didn't have time to do it. Should have done it yesterday. It's going to bring a coconut in. I know. It's a big seed, and honestly, it, it, it would do well for an illustration, but I didn't, I didn't pick up a coconut this week. So my, my apologies. Intentional purpose. Intentional purpose. In teaching high school science, I... Uh, was able to explain to my students that every seed has a soft spot. Every seed that you see, from the smallest to the largest, there's one tiny, sometimes imperceptible, soft spot. And the reason for that is this. There's a germ of life in every seed, from the smallest to the greatest, a germ of life. And oftentimes in the most terrible storm in the South, South Pacific, coconuts will be blown off of trees and cast out to sea. And, and salt water is such that it does not cause uh, necessarily way up in the middle of nowhere for a coconut to sprout. But if it's washed up on a beach somewhere and it lies still long enough, there comes an awakening with the moisture that comes and the absence of the salt water. And it's true of any seed. As soon as moisture comes, that tiny soft spot begins to absorb the moisture. And on the inside of that seed, from the smallest to the greatest, life begins to happen. We call it germination. And from the inside of that seed, small or great, comes a tiny little protrusion out of that soft spot. And if it's a root, it knows how to go down. If it's supposed to be a little uh, uh, protrusion producing leaves, it will go up. Turn it upside down, the root will change direction. Down, and the other little part will go up. Why? Because seeds know how to obey the law of God. Hello? Yeah. The purpose of a seed is to grow produce. and reproduce. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose. Intentional purpose means there is an exact purpose for your life and mine. And honestly, we need to answer that question, and when we do, it will make sense to us. What's the purpose for my life? There have been people who have not been able to find the purpose, not discover it, not been able to search through things and, and dig through the rough stuff and find out really what their purpose is, and some people choose to end a purposeless life in their estimation. In truth, it's not purposeless. Do you know what our purpose is? Our purpose is we were created for this one purpose, to enjoy the presence of God forever. That's your purpose. Not a big hairy deal. In the, in, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were created to enjoy the presence of God. In fact, it says they walked with him in the cool of the evening. In the Hebrew, it says they walked with him in the spirit. 
They knew God intimately. They knew the nuances of his voice. They knew the command of his directions. They knew the nearness and the presence of God was so great that they were clothed with his glory. They had no care about being too cold or being too hot or everything was just so great that they were naked as jaybirds in the presence of God and didn't even have a thought about it. And none of you go out of here and streak in the streets, okay? Because that's not what we're talking about. There came a moment when they disobeyed God, and when they disobeyed God, they lost that covering of his glory. And when they lost the covering of that glory, they recognized they were naked. What were they naked of? They were naked of his glory. And suddenly they became aware of their own physical nakedness, he sought out to cover themselves with fig leaves and all that kind of stuff. And you know fig leaves, if you ever buy a fig leaf suit, it won't last long. <laughs> and so God took little animals, killed them, took their coats, their skins, made permanent clothing for Adam and Eve. And from that we get the thought and the idea that innocent blood must be shed for someone's sin. That's the concept. Life is in the blood. Innocent blood must be shed. So all through the Old Testament times, and even in some cultures today, innocent blood of animals is shed to cover them over and satisfy some god that they're trying to worship. But God took care of that one day when the blood of innocent Jesus Christ Thank you, Lord. was shed for you and me. And that's why he's the perfect sacrifice. No more blood has to be shed. Praise not of animals Amen. and not of any human being. His blood was shed for you and me. I stand before you cleansed, holy, pure, and undefiled, not because I'm a good guy, but because his blood washed my life and your life too. Hallelujah. Aren't Amen. you glad for that? Amen. God's so smart. Same problem, sin. Same answer, the blood of Jesus. Same problem, same answer. Same problem, same answer. Whether you're smart or not smart, tall or not tall, Fat or not fat, skinny or not skinny, whatever, male or female, doesn't matter, young, old, in between. Same problem, sin, same answer, Jesus. That's the way it is. No other answer. In that intentional purpose to enjoy God's presence is to hear what he's saying and then multiply an answer in and through our lives. Look with me at Romans 13, verse number 1. Jesus is going to speak in parables. A parable from the Greek means to compare together. You take two things and compare them, and often it's a way of speaking so that you're telling something that is common to everybody, but in it is a truth that you must grasp. Remember the story your mom and dad told you about crying wolf? I heard that story over and over again. Little boy cried wolf, wolf, wolf. Everybody came running to help him. No wolf, he was playing a joke on everybody. Everybody goes back to town. He gets out, he goes wolf, wolf, and everybody comes running to help him. No wolf. He's, ah, oh, just kidding. You. Everybody goes back to town. This time when he cries wolf because a wolf was really there, everybody in town goes, Ain't no wolf. He's trying to fool us again. And they stayed home. And the wolf killed the sheep and bit the boy. And my mom and dad told me that story in various forms over and over and over and over and over. And they, the purpose behind it was, don't lie. Because if you lie, you don't know to whom you told what lie. And you can't keep up with yourself. It's better to tell the truth. It always stands truthful. And don't be playing around with false warnings. If you need help, say it, but don't fool around. Mm -hmm. And friends, I learned this story a long time ago, don't cry wolf. That's a parable. That's a story. Within it is a nugget of truth. You apply it to your life, that nugget of truth will assist you in many other areas. In fact, in Mark 4.13, if you don't have that scripture before you this morning, you might mark it. If you're taking notes, though, Mark 4.13, Jesus said about this very parable of the seeds planted in various kinds of soil. 
Jesus said, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? And I'm telling you from what Mark said means that Jesus was indicating this particular parable is the key to understand everything else Jesus said. And it obeys the law of seed time and harvest. Watch this. He spoke to these people. It was a great agrarian society. Plant life was their thing. And uh, that's how they live. And so they understood it. Matthew 13, 1. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. That's the Sea of Tiberias, if anyone's taking notes. And great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Calm gentle, wonderful sea. He could be in the boat and speak. The crowds wouldn't press upon him. They could hear him. Sound was amplified. Perfect setting. Beside, he wouldn't be squashed by the, by the multitude. Then he spoke many things to them in parables. Many things. But this is the most important thing that happened. It said this. He said, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some feet, a seed fell by the wayside. Birds came and devoured them. And some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the truth in that simple parable is this. The base truth is each person is responsible to pay attention. How many times did your parents say to you, pay attention to what you're doing? Don't just lumber about. Pay attention. And friends, that's what I'm saying to every heart in life this morning from the Word of God. You're responsible when the Word of God is given to you. You're responsible to pay attention. Mm -hmm. If you don't pay attention, you're going to miss the truth. And if you miss the truth, you will not learn. And if you do not learn, you will be stuck in that position until you do. How many of us have ever been given a choice to learn a lesson we didn't learn it? And you had to go around the barn and learn it again. Mm -hmm. And after about the fifth trip around the barn, you go, okay, time out. Okay. I'm going to apply this truth because I don't want to go around the barn again. Yeah? Yeah. Y'all understand? Okay. The truth of the matter is learn your lesson. You're responsible. I can't learn the lesson for you. You can't learn the lesson for me. You have to learn it for yourself. Mm -hmm. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And here in verse number 10, the disciples then come to Jesus and say to him, Now, why do you speak to them in parables? Because, see, they're grasping the truth. But the crowds don't necessarily grasp it. Some of them are going, oh, yeah. And others are going, what in the world is he talking about? Watch this now. And he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries or the hidden truths of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. Friends, if, if the authorities of that day truly understood, uh, they would just have risen in argumentation. They did later. Mm -hmm. They would rise to argue. They would rise to complain. They would rise to find some kind of reason to gripe and complain. Have you ever met that individual? You tell them something that's true and honest and right, and they mess it up every time. I've been quoted in the newspaper, and I'm going, where did the guy get that part of the story? I never said that. You ever seen it? Or I said something to someone, and they go away, and they said, Pastor said so-and-so, and I go, what? I did not. Almost makes me want to just uh, have a secretary there to write everything out and say, okay, read this, okay, yep, sign it, yep, this is what I heard, this is what you said, blah, blah, blah. It happens sometimes. But watch this. He said, it's given to you to know those mysteries or hidden things, but to them it's not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. 
In other words, use it or lose it. I said use it or lose it. If you have something and you don't use it, it will lose its ability. I, 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 I took out this week, I took a pen, a beautiful, brand new, gorgeous color of blue ink. It's a pen that's been in my, in its plastic package in my desk. I just found it. It's been there probably three years. I don't know why I've saved it. It's just blue is my favorite color. I just kind of reserved it. And would you believe I got that sucker out to write and it would not write. I think the ink dried inside in the position that it was and that ink will not flow. Brand new pen, not a scratch on it. Dog my eye. I ruined it by not using it. I'm gonna have to throw it away. You don't know how bad that gets to me. <laughs> Use it or lose it. You say, just a pen, Pastor? It's a great color blue, I'm telling you right now. But because I haven't used it in the last three years, it's become useless. Let me tell you something about your faith. Use it. God gave it to you to use. Every now and again, you'll see a story and it'll say, someone found a 1957 Chevy with only 100 miles on it. has been set up on blocks in someone's garage. And they get all excited about this car. The thing was built to drive and someone put it up on blocks. Good now for a great price, but my goodness. Someone could have enjoyed it for years. You hear what I'm saying? Use your faith. You won't use it up. Use your faith. It won't be wasted. Use your faith. It'll work. Use your faith. Let's go a little further, please. And it says this. If you have it, more will be given. If you use it, it will increase for you its value. Thank you, Lord. But if you don't lose it, use it, you'll lose it. Okay, not there. Verse 13. I could park there all day and preach, but I don't have time. 13. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Now, this may be a scripture for teenagers. <laughs> say what, mom? Say what, dad? I've been telling you five times. But, 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 but. And listen, their frontal lobes are not developed till they're in their mid-twenties, so give them a break, okay? When you ask them why and they say, I don't know why, they really are telling you the truth. I don't know why I did that. I don't know why I backed into the lamppost or the trash can or whatever. Verse 14, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. Now this is, I applied that to teenagers, but it's to anyone who's not willing to really listen and respond. But Isaiah prophesied about this. He said this, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of the people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Why? Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts. And turn so that I should heal them. Look. Determined rebellion, you're not going to get around. Are you listening? I said determined rebellion, you're not going to get around. If someone is determined, you're not going to break through very well at all. You're not going to break through. Why? Because they have determined they're not turning. I had a guy in one of our churches, he stood through praise and worship, not because it wasn't his custom, but he told me one time, he said, I'm not going to have anyone to tell me to raise my hands and worship well, wasn't he special? I wasn't asking him to raise his hands. I just thought, you know, loosen up a little bit, call him by name. Loosen up a little bit and praise the Lord however you want. And he says, I'm not going to have anyone to tell me to raise my arms. God bless his little kisser. Hey, be free in the Lord. Some of you hold your arms. That's fine. Because that's the way you worship. I'm not getting after you this morning, so don't go out of here and say, Pastor, jump my case. <laughs> not so. He says, they, they won't open up because when you open up, you come to a place of making decision. And when you must make a decision, you take the responsibility for that decision. So making no decision is a decision. Hello? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. 
Now, Brother George is a coach for people who pole vault. One of the most scary things in my life, I remember junior high school, they handed me a pole and I said, I am not capable. I said, okay, put the pole down and jump over this little bar. I said, I'll try. I tried and knocked the pole off. It was only this high off the ground. I just couldn't get myself to do it. And if, and if Brother George has a, a, a top athlete, and one day he says, you know, George, Coach George, I just don't think I can. You know what he would say? Yes, you can. You've done it before. Run. And with pole vaulting, I understand, here's the way it is. There's a target down yonder, and you've got to run like the Dickens down the track and then take that silly pole and stick it in that little spot, and it propels you up and over. 12, 13. He said he had one kid go 14, 1. Woohoo! Took third in states, I think it was, Brother George. And he sailed over the top of that. My thought is 14 feet up, and I got a fall. See, that keeps me from even starting the race. <laughs> but to the one who's been trained, they can do it. To the one who knows the process and have trained themselves, they can accomplish it. And when God says to you and me, I want you to rise up in your most holy faith and you quake and shake and say, you know, I don't know if I can do this or not. God wouldn't ask you to do something you were not capable of or not enabled to do. God asks you to do the exploits that he plants within your heart and your spirit. Amen. Not some fake dream or vision that you've come up with, but a dream or a vision that he's planted within your soul. And when he says, go for it, why don't you go for it? When he said, and it all begins with one step of obedience, one step of faith, one step of faith. Oh, watch this. And it says, but blessed are your eyes, verse 16, blessed are your eyes for they see. And your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The prophets of old would say continuously, there's coming one in the name of the Lord who will declare freedom in the land. And though they prophesied in hundreds, in some cases a thousand years before Christ, they spoke in faith mm -hmm. and release the power of God in the earth and then they looked for it to happen they grew old and wrinkled and died without seeing fulfillment but they spoke in faith anyway Isaiah was prophesying to a king one day and he's going on and on about what would happen and these wonderful things he's speaking and all of a sudden he kind of breaks stride and he says, Behold, a virgin shall bring forth a son, shall call himself, shall call him Emmanuel, God is with us, and he shall be a ruler of his people, blah, 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 and the rest of it. And then he goes into the rest of his prophecy. And he's looking around for a virgin to bear a child. Didn't find any during his lifetime, but in the fullness of time, the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, Behold, you will conceive and bear a son. You will call his name Emmanuel, for he will be God with us. Friends, I'm telling you, the prophet 900 and some odd years before spoke a word that lived for over 900 years until it became a reality. Why don't you and I believe what God has said about us? That greater is he who is in us than he is in the world. And that you can indeed do all things Hallelujah. through Christ who strengthens you. Amen, amen. Rise up in your most holy faith. I'm getting a little excited today. Yay. Rise up in your most holy faith. What exploits has God planned through you? And everyone has tried to cut you down. Everyone has tried to say, you can't do that. Everyone has said, you don't qualify. Everyone around you has said, you, nah, you'll never amount to much. I, come on, I don't know what kind of stuff you've heard. But a lot of it has been negative and trying to keep you from producing what God wants to produce in your life. Why don't we just ignore those naysayers? 
Man. And rise up and hear the one who speaks with authority from heaven and says to you and to me, you are my spokesmen and women. You are my agent in the earth. You can do everything because I've given Christ to you. The power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing from on high, the word of God within you. Faith rises up within you. So accomplish what I've assigned Hallelujah. you to. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Wow. I don't know if I can hang on much longer. Listen to this. <laughs> Blessed are your eyes. You're meant to see. Who, me? You. You. Blessed are your ears. You're meant to hear. You. Who, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> hear it. See it. Know it. Understand it. Rise up and do it. Thank you. Oh, God. And this number, verse 18, listen. He said, I'm going to tell you about the parable of the sower now. I told everybody else the story. Some got it, some didn't, most didn't. But to you, it's appointed to hear the deeper things. Now, remember, this is the key to all parables. If you hear this, it's the, it's the intentional purpose of this parable. Watch this. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, there is a result. The wicked one, the evil one, the evil one always assists in rebellion. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. Satan always assists people in doing wrong. You want to do something wrong? The devil will help you out. <laughs> You want to swear? He'll teach you some real swear words. You want to go lusting after someone or something? He'll give you lots of room to do that. You want to live a life of debauchery? He'll bring them across your path. So you don't even have to search for stuff. You want to live with alcohol ruling your life? Oh, you'll have people buying drinks for your old place. You, what is it that drug addicts know exactly where to find crud on the street? I couldn't find that stuff if I tried. <laughs> Who do you go to and ask for a handful of whatever? <laughs> I don't know. I can't help you. I don't have a phone book. He doesn't list it. <laughs> but if you want help with your sin, it will come to your door. It will be available. Why? Because Satan will always assist rebellion and sin. Always. Always. People don't even have to pray and say, send me sin. It'll come. Come on. <laughs> Evil will assist rebellion. It'll be an easy loss. An easy loss. Tell an alcoholic suffering from cirrhosis of the liver and they need to give up alcohol and they will save you most likely unless they really have had a physical scare well i can't give that up you're trying to tell me what to do with my life i, I in fact i just refuse to give it up and every day their liver dies one spot at a time friend you tell the drug addict who's been arrested several times and, and, and friends, you say to them, please stop. And they go, you don't have to tell me what to do with my life. I like my drugs. Friend, hear my heart. I'm not harping against anybody. I'm not coming down on anybody. I'm just telling you right now, God doesn't want you destroyed. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen carefully, please. If a person is hardened in sin, no impression is made by the word of God, just like on the stony pathway, and the birds come and take it away. Verse 20, but he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word of God and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. 
This is kind of a person that just goes on feelings. If it feels good, I'll do it. Oh, Jesus feels good. Let's get in. Let's get with the program. Oh, Jesus answers prayer. Whoa, oh, hallelujah. Let's get with the program. Oh, how wonderful. How wonderful. Feelings only nothing beyond relief. This is the precious person. It's like the foxhole religion. The guy is in battle. He's dug the foxhole. He's in there. Bullets are whizzing. Bombs are going. He's, oh, God, save me. I'll live for you forever. And he gets out and he says, boy, the team got me out of that one. And they go home and they go, wow, God, that's a promise I made when I was under duress. But friends, I want you to know something. What you promise to God, he'll hold you to it. I said he'll hold you to it. This, this precious person, this precious person receives, immediately sprouts up, but there's no death. And because there's no death, anytime problems come along, tribulation, persecution, because of the word immediately begins to dry up. Would you hear the word of the Lord, please? Don't be like that person, just an empty promise to God. But let the seed dwell in you richly. Thank you. Because it'll do the work. Verse 22. Now he who receives seed among the thorns, it's he who hears the word. See, people can hear it and not do anything with it. He hears the word. And the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke out the word and he becomes unfruitful. And this is the person who self is first place. You ever met someone like that? Have you ever been that kind of a person? <laughs> it's all about me. It's what I want. My wife better toe the line because it's what I want. My kids better toe the line because it's what I want. Everybody has to come in line with me because it's what I want. That kind of a self-centered person, as soon as stuff begins to come against their salvation, against their relationship to the Lord, they're going, why me? I'm such a good guy. I shouldn't have to endure this. Everything's thrown at me. I just can't stand it anymore. And pretty soon, the richness of the word is choked out in their lives. And they are unfruitful, unfruitful. No production in their life at all. It's my pursuit. It's my interest. And when Christ inconveniences me, I'm out of here. Am I getting too tough? God, as long as you bless me, I'm in. As long as everything's good, I'm in. As long as everything's fine, you can count on me, Jesus. A little pressure, a little problem, a little this or a little that. I'm out of here. You didn't answer me by tomorrow at noon. Mm -mm. No. You don't come through for me? Not going to come through for you. You promised everything? You delivered not a whole lot. I'm gone. This happened to me. I don't like it. And so I give up and walk away. This is the person. Among the thorns. Oh, you sprout up. You look good. Greenery on your little branches and twigs. But as soon as those kinds of things impinge upon us, it's the inconvenience of Jesus intersecting my life that I'm out of here. As soon as he deals with the favorite thing in your life that you've been hanging on to. Oh, you know what? Let go of it, God. Don't mess with me over this. Or I'm out of here. As soon as truth begins to penetrate your heart and call you to responsibility to make a decision, that's when we give up and turn our way away from God. My friend, don't be that kind of a person. Don't be the hard ground. The seed falls upon it. The birds eat it up and they're gone. Never penetrated, never made an impression. Don't be like the thorny ground where the weeds come up along be, be, uh, beside you and, and begin to choke you out. Don't do that. Don't be like that stony ground. Don't be like that thorny ground. Don't be like that hardened ground. But verse number 23, be the good ground for a multiplied harvest. Look, I'm telling you, the coconut that is not cracked open and eaten is the coconut that's going to find itself washed on the shore somewhere and it's going to send out a root 
and it's going to send out a, a, a primary uh, branch, and it's going to go up and produce some green leaves. It's going to absorb the sunshine, and that root's going to go deeper and spread further, and pretty soon that husk of that coconut is left on the ground as a mighty palm tree. Coconut tree begins to rise and to produce more fruit. Every seed you plant, plant it right side up, upside down, sideways, cockeyed at an angle, whatever. That little tiny portion of that seed that is soft will produce something that grows up and produce a root that goes down. And it will break ground. And, and if you leave it just right and, and the conditions are correct, that seed will not only grow and develop, it'll produce a harvest. And by the way, do you notice I never have to plant my yard with wood? Weed seeds. <laughs> they find their way in, don't they? We spray it every month so I don't have to go out and pick them up. You know what I mean? But my rose bushes, leave them alone. I planted them on purpose. And I water them. And I feed them. And they're, they look pretty when they bloom. Plants that we take care of are valuable to us. But we must take care of them. The life that God has given you in Christ is very valuable. You must take care of it. Listen just a little further, please. And it says, he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. It's not a matter of the amount you produce. It's a matter that you are productive. Amen. Somebody said, well, they're producing a hundred percent, and I'm only over here at twenty-five or thirty percent. I just, yeah, I might as well give up. Oh, stop it. Just stop it. If you're producing, you're producing. That's great. Whatever your harvest is, I'll never bring to the Lord as many people as Billy Graham has. Hello? Anybody here? A anybody have more in the books than Billy Graham does? I don't know. I don't think so. But you know what? He's not going to be the head of the line. We're going to be there before the Lord, and he's going to get the... He's, he's going to be rewarded greatly, but everyone who's ever supported his ministry in any way, shape, or form are going to share in his victories Hallelujah. and rewards. Hello, Amen. church. It's not a contest. Yeah, right. Not a contest. Will you cross the line? Oh, yes. My God, he gives us strength to run our race and cross the line. I have a lot more to say, but I just can't fit it in here. The intentional purpose of seed is growth and with full maturity in the harvest. That's the intentional purpose for seed. Seed, I have several other things to say. If you're taking notes, verse 24 through 30 deals with another parable about the kingdom of heaven. Being like a farmer who planted a vast field of wheat, an enemy came in and sowed in weeds on purpose. And the servant said, well, let's go out there and pick the weeds. And the farmer says, leave it. When he grows up, the fruit will prove itself. The wheat will absolutely show its purpose by producing fruit. Friends, don't sweat about somebody else not doing what's right. You think about yourself and your life will produce the fruit of God. Are you hearing me? I don't have time to explain it further. Verse 31 and 32, kingdom of heaven is like the smallest grain of mustard seed being planted, grew into a great tree that even the birds of the air um, that not only produce mustard seeds, but it produ produce housing for the birds of the air. You know what it says? Sin proves, a seed rather proves its purpose by producing presence. Oh, I wish I had time to preach this. That teeny seed was almost nothing, just a grain. And yet it produces a tree that even the birds can live in. Seed proves its purpose by, pro by producing presence. Are you present at work? <clears throat> Are you present in your neighborhood? Are you present in your family? Are you present in your church? Do you show up and are there where you need to be? Someone's looking for a place to rest in your branches. Will you allow them? Mm -hmm. But birds are messy. They poop all over my car if I park under a tree. So what? It's free fertilizer. <laughs> Come on. 
and you'll get some fertilizer in your life. Don't sweat the small stuff. It'll make you grow. Oh, I wish I had time to preach this. Verse 33, the kingdom of heaven is like a woman prepared to bake bread. And she put leaven or yeast into the dough. And it rose to become a loaf of bread. Seed proves its purpose by producing results. A big old blob of wet flour is no big thing. And I'm not eating it, thank you very much. But oh, when it rises. Woo, when you punch it down, woo, when it rises again, woo, when you bake it and all those bubbles are in there and that golden crust. I have a hard time with freshly broken baked bread. <laughs> Seed proves its purpose by producing results. Verse 44, kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. A man found and hid again when he sold everything he had so he could buy that field and its hidden treasure. Seed proves its purpose by revealing its value. Praise you, Lord. They have found seed in the tombs of the pharaohs that they brought out. And those crazy seeds, many of them, sprouted and grew green from thousands of years ago. What's up with that? Seems like the law of seed time and harvest is still obedient to God. Who Amen. Amen. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Seed proves its purpose by revealing its value. And then verse 35. 45. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who suddenly discovers the pearl of great value for, for sale. He goes and sells all he has and returns to buy it. Seed proves its purpose by producing great satisfaction. Great satisfaction. I heard of a, miss, a missionary, a minister missionary, came home. He'd had a heart attack in, in the hospital and so forth. In fact, that heart attack occurred right in his doctor's office. They drove him to the hospital, saved his life. Said, you got to give up missionary work, all that kind of stuff. He, he was despondent. There he was um, in his town, good-sized town in the south. And he said, he, he was just, uh, he, he ministered for us one time years and years and years ago. And I remember the story. He said, he was just saying, God, what can I do? What can I do? I mean, I'm so limited, blah, blah, blah. And he said, he was driving downtown one day, and the Lord spoke to his heart and said, buy that corner lot. He said, what? Buy that corner lot. It had an old dilapidated building on it. It looked ugly as homemade sin, and it just wasn't worth hardly anything. He discovered that it was only $5,000 for a city lot, a corner lot. For a pretty nice size thing, and... But just absolutely, you wouldn't want that lot. And so he went home. He said, I was taking the curtains off the, off the windows. We were having a yard sale. I scraped up everything I could. I got it all together. He said, I sold things in the house my wife didn't want me to sell. He said, boy, did we have a yard sale and a half. And he said, and, and then I sold everything that wasn't tied down or absolutely necessary for my family to have. And he said, I gathered the money. I bought that lot for $5,000. He said, one day we were driving downtown with some friends. And, and one of them was a realtor. And the guy, they're chuckling and giggling. And he's, as they drove down the street, and said, hey, you know, he said, see, see that stupid lot over there on that corner? He said, some idiot in town bought that thing for $5,000. It'll never be worth more than the five you paid for it. And he, and he says, and now take that lot across the street. Big, beautiful, gorgeous thing, uh, wonderful. He says, now there is a huge hotel that w is putting in a bid on this piece of property. And uh, he said, they're going to get it. And it's going to be wonderful. And I don't know what they're going to do with that lot across the street because it's such a blight. And, Blah, 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 blah. And they're laughing at this idiot that bought that lot. And, and the guy goes, <clears throat> excuse me, guys. He said, I'm that idiot. <laughs> and a little while later, it turns out that the big, huge hotel chain that put the bid on that property had so many demands on it, so many intersections of the city's decrees over that place. They gave up. And then they looked across the street at that cruddy, cruddy corner. And they said, hmm, I wonder if the idiot that bought it for $5,000 might sell it. 
to us. And they contacted him and he says, I'm going to have to pray about it. Duh! I'd go, yeah, 10000 I doubled my money, right? No, he went to prayer. You know what the Lord said to him? Lease it to them. <laughs> you know what he did? He went to a real smart lawyer. They got it together. And they leased it for a price that I can't even remember what he said it was, but it made my jaw drop. They leased it to them for 100 years. Didn't sell it. Leased it. And that hotel came in there, and they knocked all the crud out, and they built one of the premier places in that city. Beautiful hotel. Modern. Wonderful. Marvelous place. And every year he gets a big fat check. And he goes, oh, thank you, Lord. And then the Lord healed him totally in his heart. You know what he does? He goes to podunk towns with little tiny churches that can't afford to bring in some big speaker. And he preaches the fire out of faith and the word of God. And then he doesn't take an honorarium. He gives a big offering to the church. Wow! I'm talking about God who knows better than we do. Amen, amen. And if you're listening, he'll talk with you. <laughs> I'm so happy. I just cannot. Intentional purpose. I'm, I'm giving you just a summation, then I'm done. Here we go. Intentional purpose. What's my purpose? To enjoy God's presence forever by hearing and multiplying now. Seed proves its purpose by producing fruit. Fruit of your lives proves the seed of God is within you. Hallelujah. Seed produces its approves its purpose by producing presence. The presence of Jesus within you is absolutely essential. Seed proves its purpose by producing results. The results of his new life in us, phenomenal results. Seed proves its purpose by revealing its value. Heaven's value is displayed in and through each of us. Are you listening? Yeah. Last point. Seed proves its purpose by producing great satisfaction. There's satisfaction for us. There's satisfaction for our God. He is pleased to give us the kingdom. I'm talking about a God who is absolutely and totally involved with love for you and for Thank you, Lord. And is it any wonder that I invite you to respond to such a God? Is it any wonder that I say, come to the point of recognizing you're responsible for what you hear. You're responsible how you respond. You're responsible for your eternity. And Jesus says to you, I want to take the cares and the concerns of your life. I want to save your soul. I want to deliver you, set you free. I want you to plant, I want to plant the seed of heaven within you. And I want you to be assured that there one day will be a moment when I'm going to harvest you. And you're going to be in my presence forever. And it's going to be a good life full of purpose for eternity. I can't think of anything worse than being purposeless now or forever. God says, I have a purpose for you. Hallelujah. Are you that one today? It's God speaking to your heart and say, it's time to give up and yield to God and find God stirring within you new life. Oh, my God. Just bow your heads for a moment, please. Maybe that's you. Maybe you say, I've never really surrendered to the Lord. You, you, you may have a religious experience. But the seed may have fallen on hard ground and the birds have taken it away and you have no level of faith in you. And you may be like uh, among the thorns. You've sprouted a bit, you've been all happy, but some stuff has hit you and you're going, oh, brother. It's just not going your way. It's just, and you've decided enough is enough. There's God speaking to your heart and you said, well... Too many other things have piled up on me. And I don't know. I just I guess I can't trust God for this. 
And uh, maybe it's a stony ground. Or are you the good ground? The seed is finally penetrated. The soft spot of that seed has discovered moisture. And it's now beginning to sprout within you. Faith is beginning to rise. You're saying, Pastor, today is the day that I sprout for Jesus and give my life to him. Is that you? Would you raise your hand very quickly, please? And you were in the congregation. My God, he's calling upon us. Will you respond? I don't know, maybe we're all saved in the house today, but I'll tell you the truth. God's looking for, do for doing great things in us. Hallelujah. All right, church. Have you sprouted? It's God speaking to your heart and saying, but there's more, but there's more, but there's more. Are you ready for more? If you're ready for more, would you just stand your feet, please, all over the room? Stand your feet. There's always more. Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of you in this room have not yet discovered the fullness of what God has intended for you. Some of you are retired. You are not done yet. Some of you are just starting. You're not done yet. Some of you are somewhere in the middle. I didn't accomplish everything I thought I should. You're not done yet. That's right. God, don't give up. Don't disdain the day of small beginnings. Don't put down what God has already done in you. Would you pray this prayer of commitment towards the Lord today? I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm asking you to put yourself on the spot except between you and God. Would you pray this prayer out loud with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you today. I come before you today. I open my heart and spirit. I open my heart and spirit. And I invite you, Lord. And I invite you, Lord. Search deep, far and wide. Search deep, far and wide. Within me, O God. Within me, O God. Reveal to me. Reveal to me. Anything that needs your attention. Anything that needs your attention. And I'll pay attention. I'll pay attention to what you say to me. To what you say to me. And I expect, O oh God. And I expect, O oh God. Your word. Your word. The seed of heaven. The seed of heaven. Will sprout. Will sprout. And bring forth mighty things. And bring forth mighty things. In my heart and life. In my heart and life. Because you said. Because you said. That you search out. You search out. For those who are hearing and listening. For those who are hearing and listening. And you will do great things. And you will do great things. In and through me. And Search no farther. Search no farther. I give up to you totally. I give up to you totally. Do in my life. Do in my life. And through my life. And through my life. What you desire. What you desire. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Right. Look at me. You not promised me anything. I'm not coming to test you. I'm not even going to ask you at what level are you. <laughs> I'm just going to look at you and go. Whoopee, we're all growing in Jesus. That's my delight. I've seen so many of you absolutely blossom in faith where you thought you couldn't. And I'm going, yay, Jesus, hallelujah, they got it. My Lord. Jesus. If you've not been baptized, next week's the day. Father's Day, what a great day to be baptized. Woo. If you need to be baptized, prepare Call us. We'll set you up. Get you ready. Okay? Sing with me, please. How he loves you and 